Can you put this here? Yeah. Look careful, this one's hot. Alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome to another episode in our beautiful series on the topic of the gates of goodness, where we discuss a different issue every night of Ramadan in order to bring ourselves closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, both in the month of Ramadan and afterwards as well. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the most merciful, to have mercy on you and I, and I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept from you and to forgive you for your shortcomings in this month and to make us of those who are able to observe Ramadan properly and of those who are able to observe Laylatul Qadr properly. Now we have with us my dear brothers and my dear guests, the original four, mashallah ta'ala. We have my dear brother Abdullah and my dear brother Idris and my dear brother Ilyas and my dear brother Muhammad. May Allah reward you guys for your time, for your effort, for your sacrifice, for your energy. Alhamdulillah, at the very least today we were able to pray Tarawih here together. Alhamdulillah, may Allah accept from you guys. So before we get into today's topic, which is very interesting and very powerful and very important, and there's a lot to say about it, Alhamdulillah, we want to first recap yesterday's <coughs> topic. So yesterday we spoke about the virtues of the last 10 nights, and specifically Laylatul Qadr, mm -hmm. because people are looking for it. People are asking about it. It is essentially what we prepare all Ramadan for, to get to Laylatul Qadr and to have the best Laylatul Qadr. Mm -hmm. The issue is, do we know when it is, do we not? We talked about this in depth. So maybe everyone can give a small recap for the audience, something from yesterday's episode. We spoke about many things in I'tikaf and all of these things. Mm -hmm. uh, just as a piece of advice for everyone who missed yesterday's live show, even though it's recorded. I mean, we, we, we don't know, like, you know when it's exactly like, you know, Laylatul Qadr, like in the last 10 days. Like it was old, old nights, or like kind of the last five days, last seven days, last nine days, mm -hmm. last nights. Uh, but you should put lots of effort in those eight, or like those like <coughs> ten uh, days, because okay. if you had like the Qadr, yes. like it's worth more than like you know eighty thousand months, yeah. thousand months, mashallah. Subhanallah. And imagine, um, yeah, it's eighty-three years of worship. Imagine, you know, even if somebody's <coughs> unable to, let's say someone is too weak, what did the mm -hmm. Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam advise? If they're too weak or unable, what should they do then? Catch the last seven. Then at least in the last seven. Mm -hmm. So right now, you know, like we're getting very close. Mm -hmm. It's already here. It's the twenty-first night, and mm -hmm. it's very possible, according to many opinions, it could be tonight. Allahu Alam. It, it could be any of these last ten nights. Uh, my advice would be, you know, like you said, exert yourself as much as you can. But if you, for some reason, you know, you're just one of those people who just can't, <coughs> no matter what's been told or what's been said to you, at least pay, pray. You know, a few rakats yes. at night. Just a few. Just a minimum. At least you won't regret it. Yes. This, uh, this I promise you. Yes. You won't regret it. Just do a, a little bit and read a little Quran. Uh -huh. I prefer you do more, but... Yeah, just like that's it, it, actually it's very true. Yeah. So for the people who really just have a hard time motivating themselves, a hard time really finding reason to pray every single night, at the very least, try to pray a couple rakats. Perhaps that night that you prayed would be Laylatul Qadr. Mm. And you don't want to miss out because really we mentioned the one who misses out on this reward is deprived. Like they have missed out on so much. Ya Allah, it's such a huge loss to miss out on a thousand months. A thousand months. This is a night like no other. 
a night in which the decree we said you know is ordained it's brought down to the angels and it's revealed to them what will happen to us uh, today tomorrow what we, when who will die who will live the provisions the sustenance so we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us of those who are able to observe it even if it's just for a short while that night it's better than nothing and it's specifically in the last uh, you know seven nights and especially the odd nights especially the odd nights um, one thing we mentioned yesterday also was we're not entirely sure when the last 10 nights are going to begin because the month may be 29 or or 30 days. So um, when the 20th comes, inshallah, just exert as much effort you can for every single night because no. we can't be sure whether it's going to be odd or even uh, depending on when it starts. Absolutely. Um, something also remember from yesterday as well, um, you said the uh, Qadr uh, has two meanings if you like. It means first one, which Brother Idris mentioned was restriction to restrict something because it's like so many angels descend on the earth it's it's restrictive if it, maybe in terms of space because so many angels come we also mentioned that it's the it's the night in which the qadr for the next year uh, comes down so that's something i really took from yesterday's uh from, from yesterday's show Jazakallah khair. that's a very beautiful recap um i wasn't here yesterday but um, <laughs> <laughs> you probably mentioned this as well i mean layers of qadr um if you hit that day, you must. Most important in the last ten days is make du'a, make du'a for, yes. um, for, for to, to Allah, so yes. He can help you yeah. get closer to Him. No. That's the most important thing because if you get closer to Allah, that's it. You don't need anything else. Yes, that's, Subhanallah. That's the ultimate goal of Ramadan, the ultimate goal of Laylatul Qadr, the ultimate goal of the last ten nights to get closer to Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, to His mercy, to His forgiveness, to His <coughs> blessings, to His uh, praise. All of these things, uh, Jazakum Khairan, are a beautiful recap. And so ultimately, we want to work as hard as possible. And when someone is feeling lazy in these last 10 nights, they can remind themselves, listen, I'm going to strive. Tell your nafs, no, tonight I am lazy, I'm tired, but I'm going to force myself. It's just these 10 nights. Yes. There are no other 10 nights like these in the year. These are the best 10 nights of the year. Just these 10 nights, strive mm -hmm. as much as possible. Now, of course, during the day and, and the other things that you're doing, work, and if, you, uh, if there's a busy mother out there, if someone's unable to pray, they have other things they can do. But throughout the night, at least try to strive to take advantage because <coughs> wallahi, this is something like no other. It is a magnificent uh, blessing. Um, I think there's a hadith, and correct me if I'm wrong, um, about those people who can't do it because they feel lazy or, and they still do it, they take more ajr for doing it. So basically, I don't know if there's a hadith on this, but I know that the more uh, it requires of effort, the harder, the more difficult it is, the more reward you get. So the reward is equivalent to the effort, basically. Mm -hmm. And so somebody for him, like the example is the one who reads Quran, right? Mm -hmm. So the one who reads gets the reward of 10 hasana per letter, right? According yeah. to one opinion. And the, uh, the other hadith mentions that the one who has difficulty oh, gets yeah, twice the reward. Oh, so <coughs> about the Quran, yes. Yeah. So it's about the Quran, that's what you're talking yeah. about. So usually when there's, a more, when there's more effort required, you get a greater amount of reward. <coughs> so we want to really work hard to make sure we hit Laylatul Qadr. One advice that we gave is donate every night consistently and you are guaranteed to donate on Laylatul Qadr. Mm -hmm. And that's greater than a thousand months of worship. Just a question. You know, we uh, spoke about, you know, reading the Quran difficulty. Um, would it extend to the sisters who are not able to touch the Mus'haf? Maybe you have, is it, can we extend it to that or, or is it just for people who cannot read, it's difficult for them to read Arabic? I don't really see a connection between the two because w w in one case somebody has a difficulty actually reading mm. and so there's nothing really mentioned about uh, a reward for not being able to read mm. or touch the Mus'haf because even the one who's in a state of Janaba cannot touch the Mus'haf. Mm. However, we mentioned the opinion, uh, this is the opinion that I follow and many scholars have stated this opinion, is that uh, women who are on their cycles are allowed to still read Qur'an. They're not allowed to touch the Mus'haf mm. but they can still recite. Yeah. And we mentioned the example, as the scholars say, they're allowed to use you know, smartphones and electronics and they don't, you know, there's no, no problem with that. So the good thing about this is that everyone is able to read Quran, read, basically, yeah. inshallah ta'ala. And so this is one of the things you want to be doing every <coughs> night in these 10 nights. Read a little bit of Quran as much as possible. You want to be making dua, a lot of istighfar, a lot of dhikr. <coughs> and ultimately, if you're able to, then pray as much as possible. And so we reminded ourselves with the foundational hadith of Laylatul Qadr. Man qama Laylatul Qadr imanan wahtisaban ghufira lahu ma taqaddam in dhammi. So the one who stands on the night of Laylatul Qadr imanan with faith and sincerity and hoping for the reward, hoping for the mercy of Allah, hoping for His forgiveness, this person, their previous sins will all be forgiven. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us of those who are uh, able to catch Laylatul Qadr. Allahumma balighna Laylatul Qadr. We ask Allah mm -hmm. subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us of those who are accepted on that night and mm -hmm. protected mm -hmm. from the punishment of the hellfire. Today's topic, inshallah ta'ala, is a topic that has been prepared for really well and is very uh, deep and very uh, important. And this is a topic that changes people. 
This is a topic that will really change you. And if you look back and you see where you were and where you are now, most of the difference is because of what you know. So we're going to talk today, inshallah ta'ala, about knowledge. Knowledge is power. Knowledge truly is power. <coughs> and so what we're talking about today, what we're specifically <coughs> referring to is knowledge for the sake of Allah, mm -hmm. uh, beneficial knowledge, anything that will bring you closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now what are, before we get into the hadith, what are some of the ayat that indicate the importance of knowledge? A lot, Sheikh. A lot. What are yeah. some of them? <laughs> like in the one where it says those who know are not like those who don't know. قُلْ هَلْ يَسْتَوِ الَّذِينَ يَعْلَمُونَ وَالَّذِينَ لَا يَعْلَمُونَ Say, are those who know, those who have knowledge, like those who do not, there's no comparison between yeah. the two, especially in the sight of Allah. Another ayah that's often mentioned, إِنَّمَا يَخْشَ اللَّهَ مِنْ عِبَادِهِ الْعُلَمَاءِ so verily, those who fear Allah the most, those who have the most taqwa, mm -hmm. are those who know the most, those who have the most knowledge. Exactly. There's another ayah, and this is the one we want to start talking about and moving into the hadith. So the Prophet ﷺ was never commanded to ask for more of something except knowledge. Right? وَقُرْ رَبِّي زِدْنِي عِلْمَ زِدْنِي عِلْمَ And say, my Lord, increase me in knowledge. Mm. Allah never commanded the Prophet ﷺ to ask for more of anything except knowledge. Showing the emphasis and the importance of knowledge in our lives. And so knowledge will change you in this world and knowledge will benefit you in the hereafter. And so we want to talk a little about the hadith related to knowledge. What are some of the narrations that we know of that, that people usually know of, the foundational hadith in regards uh, to seeking knowledge? Like, man salaka tariqan yaltamisu fi ilman sahal Allah tariqan yal jannah whoever yes. like uh, follows the path like you know for like knowledge Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make it easy for like make it like the, the the path to paradise is like easy for him. Mm. Absolutely. So this is one of the hadith that's mainly used. Whoever sets upon a path to seek mm -hmm. knowledge, Allah will make easy for this person the path to Jannah. Mm -hmm. If you want your path to paradise to be made easier, then start seeking knowledge consistently. <coughs> Everything we talk about today is in regards, uh, in regards to consistency. So people want to earn Jannah. People want to get to Jannah. People want it to be easier. Mm -hmm. Some people find it difficult, mm -hmm. right? The salah, the fasting, all of this, whatever it may be, staying away from the sins. They don't realize that knowledge changes all of that. Knowledge changes you completely. You become a different person. You become enlightened. You become wiser. Uh, you become more humble. Mm -hmm. You become aware of how little you know when you seek knowledge. Right? Mm -hmm. right. So they say there's three stages of knowledge. <laughs> the first stage is what? You think you know everything. You think you know everything. <laughs> right? Somebody starts reading a little or hearing some lectures the or their sheikh says something or starts talking about other people. <coughs> so they're like, oh, I have all the knowledge. They start going around showing people this knowledge with their arrogance. What's another stage of knowledge? You realize you didn't know much before. Okay, so you realize you don't know much before, right? And what's the third stage of knowledge? You realize you don't know anything. You realize you don't know anything. <laughs> <laughs> so this is really where, we, where you're supposed to be at. Yes. Where you think, uh, you, you realize through your studies mm -hmm. that you don't know anything at all. And you think to yourself, SubhanAllah, I know so little compared to how much is out there. It's a deep ocean. So a lot of people will come, for example, you know, I'm, I work at a masjid. So a lot of people come to the masjid and ask all kinds of questions. A lot of people will send messages on Facebook or online or through email asking all kinds of questions. People will call random times, ask all kinds of questions. Some of the questions are basic. Some of them are, are deep. Some of them are very advanced. Some of them are kind of silly. And so all of this falls under the category of knowledge. Knowledge changes us. Mm -hmm. Knowledge changes us. And so it's good to always ask. And it's always good to ask the correct sources, right? Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. always good to get knowledge from the right places because if you're taking knowledge from people who tell you only take knowledge from me, then there's a problem with this. If there's somebody that's calling to himself or to herself, don't take from this person because everyone should be calling to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So with the issue of knowledge, it makes the path to Jannah easier. <coughs> Not only that, we have the long narration which we'll translate and summarize inshallah ta'ala in which the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa tells us that the one who sets upon a path to seek knowledge, mm -hmm. Allah will make easy for this person the path to Jannah. And the angels, they lower their wings out of humility, mm -hmm. out of humility mm -hmm. for this person. And all of the angels in the heavens and the earth and all yeah. of the animals, the creatures in the, on the earth and in the oceans are making istighfar for this person. Even the fish in the depth of the ocean are making istighfar for this person. The one who's seeking knowledge. In one hadith, it mentions even the ants in their homes, inside the ground, they're making istighfar for this person, for seeking knowledge. The Prophet wasallam said in this hadith, he said the difference between the learned person, the alim, and the mm -hmm. abid, just the devout worshiper, mm -hmm. like the one who just prays and fasts, but they don't know anything, is like the difference between myself and the lowest person of the ummah. The Prophet wasallam and the lowest person of the ummah. He said this is the difference between the knowledgeable one and the one who has no knowledge, the devout worshiper. Mm -hmm. So you really are reaching a high, there's a big difference. 
There's no comparison between these two. Mm -hmm. So the Prophet ﷺ tells us about all these things in order to encourage us more to seek knowledge. And the Prophet ﷺ says that who, um, whoever takes from this inheritance of the Prophets, mm -hmm. because the Prophets don't leave that behind money or anything like this, whoever takes this inheritance of knowledge, this is all that they've left behind, this person has gained an abundance, a vast portion, a vast treasure. So you want a treasure. You want to get what the Prophet ﷺ left behind? Seek knowledge. One time Abu Huraira radiallahu an, he walked out to the people in the marketplace. He said, O oh people, go to the masjid because they are distributing the inheritance of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Everyone wants inheritance. Mm -hmm. So everyone starts running. Imagine like a stampede of people. Mm -hmm. They run to the masjid, masjid of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Yes. And they look around, they see like a halaqa of dhikr, a halaqa of like they're studying something and some people making dua, some people praying. They're looking around, they're like, where's the inheritance? They go back to Abu Huraira, they're like, you tricked us, man. There's no inheritance. They're like, you told us there was inheritance. We went there and all we saw is uh, some circles of dhikr and circles of knowledge, some people praying. He said, that is the inheritance of the Prophet. Yes. Sallallahu alayhi wa So this is the inheritance that we seek. But subhanAllah, some people want that of this life, some people want that of the hereafter. Right? So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam tells us that the one who seeks knowledge is in a state of jihad, in a state of struggling <coughs> because they're putting in effort until they get back to their homes until they're done seeking knowledge, basically. So they're always, in one hadith is mentioned, they're in a state of worship, right? Until they're, they're back to their homes. Because they're putting in so much effort. This was the knowledge where they had to go places. So like, for example, in the past, you know, you had to travel to find a scholar if you didn't have a local one. Mm -hmm. And sometimes they would travel for months and they would leave behind their families. They would leave behind, sometimes even their children and their wives. They would leave behind, uh, sometimes their parents who need their help. They would go try to seek knowledge purely for the sake of Allah through all of this effort. Traveling nowadays is so much easier. Mm -hmm. People have cars, people have you know, uh, transportation, people have airplanes. So it's not even difficult to go get knowledge. But the problem is, we don't even have to do that anymore. The knowledge is accessible to us. The scholars are you know, widespread. There are many scholars we can take from. And even students of knowledge that we can take from. So it's very accessible. The problem is people are no longer seeking it. People are not giving knowledge. It's right. It's not being put on a pedestal as it should be. Because sadly, and I know this sounds very frank and to some people controversial, in some countries, if you score like a 95% or higher, Loyal. right, in your, in your last year of high school, then you enter uh, medical school. Yes. And mm -hmm. like a 90% to 95, I think in some countries, like Sounds law school, good. engineering, and this and that. And the lowest, 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 lowest category are the ones who have to go into Sharia. The yes. ones who have to go study Islamic law. So it's placed at the bottom. And in, this is like, I'm very frankly, this is in many of our Middle Eastern countries, right? So it's placed on a very, very, very low place. Very low position. Anyone can go in there. And some of the people that go into there are some of the worst people. And it doesn't change them. Rather, this causes more problems. Mm -hmm. Whereas, for example, in the West, and this is very common nowadays, a lot of people are trying to find authentic knowledge. They don't know where to go. They're trying to access the resources we have there, the limited resources. Uh, there's so much demand and there's so low supply. So many of them are going to seek knowledge in other countries, like in the Middle East and in mm -hmm. India and Africa. They're traveling for it. And they are actually traveling, leaving their families and going back after many years to help people with this knowledge. So really it depends on the person how much uh, they give, how much priority you give to knowledge. How do you perceive it? Some people think, oh, that's just knowledge, it's not a big deal. We know if I have a question, I'll just go ask a shaykh. Mm -hmm. Right? But then how about your life? How about your enlightenment? How about your nearness to Allah? How about the path of Jannah becoming easier for you? This is the inheritance that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa left behind. There's nothing else you can inherit from it. So you want to inherit from Rasulullah sallallahu take the knowledge that he left behind. And so we want to talk a little about some of the examples of how striving for knowledge is a sign of, of sincerity, right? Because you need sincerity. Uh, can any of you tell us about the long narration? Uh, tell us about the hadith, uh, just the beginning of it. On the day of judgment, the first three people to kindle the hellfire, right? Who are the first three people to be kindled into the hellfire? Uh, uh, one of them is someone who fought and... Um, they will be asked, you know, why was you fighting? He says, I was fighting for you, Allah. He said, uh, you lied. You were fighting for, so people can say you're brave and courageous. No. You got what you asked for and then he'll be thrown on his face into the And he'll the even hellfire. deny. He'll say, no, Allah, I did it for your sake. Mm. Allah will say, no, you have lied. Yeah. Because Allah knows our intentions. Yeah, of course. Yeah. yeah, so that's the first one. And uh, Another one is someone who gave charity. Yes. Who, um, and then he'll be asked, you know, why did you give charity? He says, oh, I gave charity for your face. And he said, no, you lied. You've given charity so people can say you're generous. <coughs> you got what you've done it for and he'll be thrown into his face on the hellfire. And the last one is someone who learned, who uh, sought knowledge. And taught it. And taught it. And Allah will say, why did you, why did you do this? 
and he'll say, I've done it for your sake. We said, no, you learned and taught so people could say that you're a scholar. You know, and you got what you asked for and then he'll be thrown in his face to, to the fire. Billah. Wallahi, this hadith, you know, when we talk about it, uh, you know, I gave an entire lecture about this as a, as a topic of sincerity. Because this hadith is one of the most frightening hadith. That the first three people, Ibn, uh, I think Imam Muslim says in one narration, it ends with, and these are the first three people of the creation to kindle the hellfire on the Day of Judgment. Wallahi, wow. Billah. And look at who they were. People perceived them as something great. And they th themselves thought they were doing something great. But your intention really matters. The intention really matters. Faith has to be there. So this goes back to even you know, the topic of Ramadan, Iman and Wahtisaban. Mm. You have to be doing it with the right intention. And you have to be hoping for the reward. Not for the people and not for worldly reasons. So these are people who strive, but they didn't do it for the sake of Allah. They did it for the people. Did they get a reward? Yes, they got the reward from the people. Mm. And that's the only reward they get. But when you seek the pleasure of Allah and you do something for the, for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you'll get the reward of Allah and Allah will even place the love of this person in the hearts of the people. So it's a win-win situation. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect us from insincerity in all aspects of life. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us of those who are protected from the punishment of the hellfire and to make us of those who strive for knowledge sincerely for His sake. We're going to go to a Ramadan report, actually in your country, inshallah ta'ala. A Ramadan report from around the world, I believe from England, I'm not sure. And then when we come back, we'll continue talking about sincerity and insincerity and some of the steps that we can take, even if you know nothing at all, so that you can uh, start advancing, inshallah ta'ala, seeking knowledge for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Stick around. We'll be right back. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Ramadan in England. Islam is the second largest religion in the United Kingdom. There are more than two and a half million Muslims in the British population. Many Muslims in Britain traveled from their home countries to pursue work and study opportunities in the UK. The majority of these foreign Muslims residing in the United Kingdom are from Africa, the Middle East, India and Pakistan. Muslims in the UK follow the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia in terms of Islamic practices, including the fasting of the holy month of Ramadan. Muslims in the UK break the fast by eating a few dates and drinking a small amount of water or juice, as they also prefer to remain awake and to wake up during the pre-dawn meal or the suhoor. Britain is a very busy country, and typically Muslims in the UK are not given leave from work or holidays during the month of Ramadan. Therefore, there are many restaurants that cater to Muslims in the UK selling halal food for the month of Ramadan. However, Ramadan is widely accepted across the UK. This is evident in all the universities that accommodate the Muslim students on campus. During the holy month of Ramadan, mosques in Britain receive large numbers of Muslims who come to participate in congregational prayers as well as the daily prayers and the evening prayers after Aisha, the Tarawiyah prayers. In many mosques, Muslims spend long time reading the glorious Quran and many other uh, Islamic texts. During the month of Ramadan, non-Muslims in the country are known to embrace Islam and take Shahada during the month. During the Layla to Qadr, the mosques in Britain are filled to capacity. Wealthy Muslims in Britain handsomely spend their wealth in the mosques for the needy. Eid is a special day for all Muslims in the UK. Following the Eid prayer, they embrace and pray for each other, asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept their efforts during the month of Ramadan. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Welcome back from the Ramadan report. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless our brothers and sisters all around the world to accept from us in this month to create a greater bond between our hearts to make us as one and to uh, grant relief to all of those who are oppressed. Jazakumullah khairan to our guests again. Exactly. So we were talking about, um, you know, before we went to your country. <laughs> May Allah reward you. Do you know any of the people in the report? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding with you. So the topic of knowledge is very important. A lot of people think, oh, I don't, I'm, that's not for me. I want to be a good Muslim, but I, I can't seek knowledge. They mm. think knowledge is like you have to go become a scholar. No. Not everyone is expected to be a scholar. 
But you have to, first of all, the basics. What is the basics <coughs> everyone has to know? They have to know the foundational part of Islam. Mm -hmm. You have to know the basic part of belief in Allah, the love of Allah, who is Allah. And then you have to start knowing the basic fiqh, basic ibadah, just how to pray, how to fast, taking care of basic things. And when you have questions, you have to ask someone. You cannot just say, well, I have a question, I don't know the answer, oh well. No, you go ask someone, get some help. Someone who is uh, trustworthy, right? Mm -hmm. So knowledge helps us in many ways. What are some ways that knowledge you know, can benefit us? Sheikh, like uh, as a Muslim, like you know, you are like a da'iya preacher for your religion. And if you have knowledge, you will be studying like a preacher. Uh, the Prophet peace upon him, like you know, said like anni wa like uh -huh. you know, deliver like even like a verse from my kind of my knowledge. So like you started being like you know, um, you're taking like the Prophet's like you know job description thing and like I'm trying to go preach all these cool things about you about your religion and all these things. So like you, you be like a messenger or like the messenger peace upon him. Subhanallah. Yeah, it is. Um, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. By the yeah. way, I was going to say, mashallah, you are a good role model to people. Like when you, you convey you know, the message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, yeah. I've seen a lot of people benefit. You know, I've actually followed some of the things you've shared before. Exactly. And that's very important. A lot of people yeah. think when you have knowledge or you're spreading knowledge, you have to yeah. look a certain way or, or be a certain thing. No. They have the wrong impression sometimes, yeah. maybe because of culture or other reasons. Mm -hmm. But uh, we all need to be good role models in general. Yes. And anyone can be a good role model. And this is what knowledge does. It helps us mm -hmm. become better for ourselves, for our families, for society at large. I just mentioned two, two brief things that knowledge can benefit us. One is the hadith, that three things will benefit us um, after our death. Of course, we've, we've mentioned this before. And uh, one of those is knowledge that, that, that benefits someone else. So uh, if you were to write, write a book or you were to teach someone something, that knowledge you, that you intimidated to that person will benefit you after you're gone. And the second thing is that knowledge builds yaqeen, it builds cer you know, certainty, it builds that conviction which made you know, the best generation the best. I've yeah. said it a million times, but you need to have this conviction in your heart. If you don't have it, you're going to feel lost. Absolutely. Jazakallah khair, that's very beautiful. You know one example mm -hmm. we want to give? We said people, they used to have to travel to for knowledge, right? Mm -hmm. They had to work hard for it. Mm -hmm. And the traveling itself was very dangerous. Mm -hmm. You know, you're traveling by two, three months by horse or camel or whatever it may be, it was very difficult. And this is something a lot of people in the past, when they did it, this shows how sincere they were. Exactly. So we want to talk a little about this issue of sincerity because it's so important when seeking knowledge because in our times, a lot of people are doing it for the wrong reasons. And this is why we always try to renew our intention. Why am I doing what I'm doing? Mm -hmm. And we try to ask ourselves, can I purify my intention more? And you ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help mm -hmm. you uh, become more sincere with this. So for example, Al-A'mash, one of the teachers, uh, one of the scholars of the past, he had a dog in front of his house in order to filter out the students that didn't really want the knowledge. He wanted the ones who wanted knowledge to work hard for it. So the students, they would see the dog, they would try to like evade it. They found out like different tactics like, hey, you distract it, I'll run inside the house with a scholar. Like, they tried to find all these different tactics to get around the dog. Some students, they just gave up. They said, oh, there's a dog, I guess I'm going to go mm -hmm. until the dog is gone. And the dog stayed for a long time. You know, that, that he owned the dog. So what ended up happening is uh, some of the students made it. And he said, these are the ones that really <coughs> wanted it. That they would do anything to get it. So we ask ourselves, what am I willing to do to get knowledge? How much effort am I willing to put in to get knowledge? To really change myself, to become a better person. So when the dog died, Al-Amash actually said, he died, fi sabilillah, like for the sake of Allah. And he was actually kind of sad about it. Because the dog was filtering out, you know, the students who really wanted it, the students who didn't really want it. Another thing that shows our, sh our sincerity or insincerity is some people when they get into knowledge, they get into the wrong topics, mm. right? What are some examples <coughs> of this? Uh, I find a lot of time fatawa. It's um, a lot of the times um, someone will get that iman rush or accept Islam and <coughs> before they learn some Quran and before they learn some hadith etc. The first thing they come, this person said this and that person said that and it really I wouldn't say that it corrupts their Islam, but they don't find these people improving on, on their character, too busy no. debating other people, and they're the ones who a lot of the time burn out exactly. and end up, some of them, <coughs> well, to be like, stop praying right. and um, you know, really making a big mess of, of, of things. And so this is, subhan this is exactly what ignorance is. Yeah. All of that is ignorance. So they, they haven't really gotten the right knowledge. They haven't been enlightened by correct knowledge and they didn't get beneficial knowledge. Yeah. That's why one of the dua the Prophet Sallallahu used to make is Allahumma inni as'aluka ilman nafi'ah. Mm. So I, oh Allah, I ask you for beneficial knowledge. Mm. What is qan tayyibah and pure sustenance? Wa amala mutaqabbal and accepted actions. So this is one example. Another example is that they, so the first example is very common. Mm. People get into knowledge 
They become religious, suddenly they start knowing everything. They label this guy, they label this guy, mm. they label these, this group, this group. They start creating divisions between people, putting people down. They don't, and most of the time, like 99% of the time, they're not, they don't even have good manners themselves. Mm. So they're not bringing people closer to Allah, they're pushing people away from Allah. And they think they really have conviction, like you said, mm. they really have conviction that they're on the correct path. I'm correct, you guys are all not part of the sunnah, and you guys are this and you guys are that. And so they're <coughs> pushing people away from Allah. Knowledge, wallahi, real knowledge does not push people away from Allah. Real knowledge brings people to Allah. Exactly. So the problem is with the person and what they're hearing and who's teaching them. This is the issue. Another thing that people get into is they start learning useless or silly facts, right? Trivial mm. things. Mm. So for example, one person came to uh, Imam Shatibi, I believe it's Imam Shatibi. He asked him, what is the name of Iblis's wife? The shaitan's wife. Mm. And the, the shaykh responded, he said, I don't know, I wasn't invited to their wedding. <laughs> <laughs> and so subhanAllah, like meaning, like don't ask me the silly question. And one time somebody came to Imam Abu Hanifa, and he asked like kind of a question that was kind of silly. The guy was just always asking questions. And Imam Abu Hanifa was trying to teach him, relax, like don't, you don't have to ask about everything. You're making it more difficult on yourself. Mm -hmm. So the man said, uh, oh Imam, like if I'm, in the, if I'm in the river and I'm taking, a, I'm doing ghusl, like I'm taking a bath, and I left my clothes, you know, on the side of like the river, like the river bank, um, which, in which way should I face during the ghusl? Do I have to face the qibla? Like, do I have to face a certain way? And he's like, no, you should face your clothes so that nobody steals your clothes while you're <laughs> in the river. <laughs> so he's trying to like basically say, this is like, you know, relax a little. Yeah. So they were also making jokes sometimes. But ultimately, you don't want to jump into the wrong topics. Mm -hmm. Some people, this is where a lot of people fall into this trap. They get into the fitna, right? They get mm. into the topic of the fitna. So they start talking about Ali, they start talking about Muawiyah and Yazid and the people of the past, the war that took place. And it's an unfortunate event. But is there a benefit? Is there really a great benefit from you taking sides or talking about it? Probably not. Because they came to Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah, and they asked him. They asked him who was correct in that fitna. He said, I don't know. And I don't care because on the day of judgment, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will ask me about Nu'man, myself. His name is Nu'man. He said, Allah is not going to ask me about Ali or Muawiyah. He said, don't ask me about this. He never answered. He never talked about it. So basically, try not to jump into the things that are not really going to benefit you. Get into the topics that will benefit you. Get into the topics that you can start implementing. And get into the topics that will increase your iman. These are really important. So this is a combination of the basics of Islam. Right? Now some people, they want to know if they're sincere or not. Right? So we, we all try to seek knowledge in one way or another. We all mm. maybe read a book or listen to a lecture or a series or we're studying actively whether university or online. Wallahi, there's so many resources in our times. There are so many resources, <coughs> countless. We really don't have an excuse not to learn the basics. So the question that many people will ask, how do we know if we're sincere or not? How, what can we check to see if we're sincere or not? Yeah. If you, one thing that you will show your sincerity is that how much of what you're learning are you implementing? Exactly. SubhanAllah, that's the so. first thing I listed. So am I being changed by what I'm learning? Right? Mm -hmm. am, I, am I being changed? Am I implementing what I'm learning? This is a sign of sincerity. What else? Um, continuation, if things, are, if things become difficult. Yes. So, yeah. subhanAllah, am I consistent with this knowledge? <coughs> or am I only doing it when you know, I, I feel like and I'm just stopping other times? So am I really trying to seek knowledge for the sake of Allah? That's another sign of sincerity. What else? Delivering the um, knowledge. So mm -hmm. delivering the knowledge, meaning uh, what, are, what are you doing with the knowledge for mm -hmm. other people as well? So this exactly. can also show a sign of sincerity in which, uh, it depends on the delivery method, mm -hmm. in which you want people to benefit from it as well. Because a lot of times you read something interesting or a hadith that just moves you, and then you say, subhanAllah, I want everyone to know this hadith. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right? We've all probably experienced this in one way or another. Some people, as soon as they benefit from something, they'll go post it up online because they love you know, their friends and family mm -hmm. and they want everyone to benefit. Mm -hmm. So this is a good thing. Yes. What is another sign? We can mention one more at least. How far are you willing to go for that knowledge? Mm -hmm. Right? Yes. How far are you willing to go to for that knowledge? So what are you willing to do? Some people are willing to travel. Some people are willing to pay whatever it takes. SubhanAllah, th there were two students. Uh, we have an institute there. Maybe I shouldn't mention the name. Where some people would go study for a year and then go back home. In the United States. It's there. So some students, you know, they said, oh, it's too expensive. I can't afford it. Other students, they, they literally worked so hard morning and night. They went and asked people for help, for, for donations. And they even made like online fundraising, crowd, uh, crowdfunding or whatever it's called. And they said, please, you know, help us fulfill this dream of ours to seek knowledge for this one year program. And they did it. And they went. So it really shows how far are you willing to go? What are you willing to do? What are you really willing to sacrifice? Time, energy, uh, maybe your ego, whatever it may take. So some people want knowledge more than others. 
Now, we mentioned how the people of the past, they would have to strive for it, they would have to work hard for it. And we know how uh, the scholars used to warn us not to do things that would not really benefit us. So we want to talk about uh, using the knowledge. Using the knowledge. So a lot of people hear things. A lot of people, maybe they're tuning in right now, they're listening to this. A lot of people, they'll read a lot of books, mashallah. <coughs> they'll study with a lot of shiuch. They'll study um, maybe a hadith. They'll study whatever it may take. And then they ask themselves, what am I doing with it? How am I implementing it? So you look at Imam al nawi rahimullah. Imam al nawi what are some of his famous works, the most famous works? Riyadh well, al-Salihin. Riyadh al-Salihin is one of them. Yeah. And, and the 40 ahadith. And the compilation of the 40 ahadith, right? Imam mm-hmm. al nawis 40 ahadith. Now, were there other scholars that compiled 40 hadith? Yeah. Yes. Like a few? A lot. Many. Yes. Many. Some scholars say it's over a hundred. And yet the most popular one in the entire world is the print of Imam Nawi, the book of Imam Nawi, the compilation that he came up with of 40 hadith. And so you look at it and the <coughs> reason for this is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala magnifies your effort. Your sincerity goes far. Your sincerity is shown through your action. If you act upon it, you become a doer and not just a talker, then you, you have kind of fulfilled the sincerity. Imam Nawi, rahimullah, did he die extremely old? Imam Nawi, no, died no. as one of the youngest 40s. scholars of the past. Yes. Some, said, some said in his 30s, some said in his 40s, actually. Mm. Some said 33, some said 45. Allahu Adam. But either way, 45 or 33, he died young considering that he was a scholar. And yet, he was one of the most productive scholars in all of history. We have, almost so, we have so many works from Imam Nawi, rahimullah, right? And his books, even the few that, the, that, are, that we have, are super popular. Very popular. So Allah magnified his efforts. Now, we have the example of Imam Malik, rahimullah. Mm. He was sitting in the masjid of the Prophet, and he was teaching hadith. Okay, so these are the students that would end up becoming the narrators of which book? Al Muwatta. Al Right, so what happened was Imam Malik is teaching them hadith, somebody runs into the masjid. He says, there's elephants in Medina, there's elephants in Medina. There's, there aren't really elephants in Medina, meaning this is rare. So everyone gets up, they want to see the elephants for the first time in their lives. And the students, they get up in front of their teacher, and they rush out. They run out right in front of the teacher. Imam Malik was just sitting there. So all the students leave, except for one student. Mm-hmm. Who was that student? Shafi. No, it was Yahya ibn Yahya. Oh. Yahya ibn Yahya al So he stayed sitting there. And Imam Malik kind of like was confused. You know, all your friends kind of ran out. He wasn't like upset. Mm-hmm. He was just kind of confused. Like, why are you still here? <coughs> so he asked him, he's like, have you seen elephants before? He said, no. He said, then why didn't you go see the elephants right now? Mm-hmm. He said, I came, I traveled all the way here to study from Imam Malik, to see Imam Malik, not to see the elephants of Medina. <laughs> <laughs> and you know what happened to him? This was a beautiful story. And this is real. But do you know what happened to him? Because of his sincerity, and this is one example that Allah you know, allowed us to see of it, and there's probably much more that we couldn't see. Because of his sincerity, now if you study the book, uh, if you study the Muwatta of Malik, the narration that's most dependent on from the east to the west is the narration through Yahya ibn Yahya to get to Imam Malik, rahimahullah. Right? So Yahya ibn Yahya was not the most knowledgeable student there. There were students that were way more advanced, way more knowledgeable. But he was sincere. He was very sincere. <coughs> so Allah magnifies your efforts. There was a, a scholar in, uh, in Medina in the 50s. He came as a radio technician. He wasn't a scholar back then. He came as a radio technician, right? So he comes as a radio technician, and he's, all he's, his job is required to do is set up the sound system for one of the scholars. I believe it was Sheikh al-Shalqit, rahimullah. And when you set up the sound system, you just have to wait until he's done with the lecture, turn it off, and put it away. Come back the next day and do the same thing. And he was actually from here, from Egypt. You know, so they imported him into Medina. This is way before they had you know, the sound systems. So what happened is, um, over time, he started benefiting from the talks that he's hearing because he's setting up the sound system. Eventually, he uh, quits his job. He becomes a full-time student from, uh, for, for that teacher. He becomes a full-time student. He studies and studies and studies. After Shaykh al-Shalqiti uh, passed away, they said they looked around and could not find anyone more knowledgeable or suitable to sit in that seat in the masjid of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam than this teacher. And this is a blessing from Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. This is truly a blessing from Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala and a sign of sincerity. And his seat in the masjid was actually in the center, which is even more honor. In the center of Masjid Nabu, you know they have the teachers all over the masjid. So he was in the, in the center. So SubhanAllah, our knowledge and our sincerity makes a big difference. And we have many examples and many stories actually. We don't really have time for all of them. What we're going to do inshallah ta'ala is we're going to go to a, a report inshallah ta'ala. When we come back, we will continue and talk about some of the ways to continue seeking knowledge sincerely 
and what are some starting steps, action items for some of our viewers, inshallah ta'ala. Uh, stick around, we'll be right back, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. peace be upon him said was preserved within the text of Islam you will find the companions talk about every single detail of his life and it's not like someone said it and then oh today we say so-and-so person said it right whenever the Prophet peace be upon him said something a companion memorized it and after he memorized it he then transmitted it to his student and he transmitted it to his student he transmitted it to his student and it came all the way down till today and if you ask me regarding any narration that I put in front of you Anything I say that, that I attribute to the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, I can sit here and tell you all of my teachers who said it to who, who said it to who, who said it to who, all the way back to we reach the name of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Right? 20 odd people be, be, lie between myself and the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and every single narration that we study. So Islam has a very rich tradition. A very, very rich tradition. You want to know about the animals the Prophet, peace be upon him, rode? We can tell you about that. You want to know which types of meat he ate in his life? We can tell you about that. And not just say it, that he may have done this. We know for a fact he did this. You want to know which vegetables the Prophet peace be upon him ate in his life? We can tell you about that. Which fruits he consumed? We can tell you about that. You want to know about his diet? We'll tell you about that. What color he loved? We'll tell you about that. What kind of cloth he wore? We'll tell you about that. Who were the six children who urinated in his lap? We can tell you their names too. Anything you want to know about the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him. You want to know his forefathers' names? His forefathers are who? Muhammad ibn Abdullah ibn Abdul Muttalib ibn Hashim ibn Abdul Manaf ibn Qusay ibn Kilab ibn Murra ibn Ka'b ibn Lu'ay ibn Ghalib ibn Fihr ibn Malik ibn Nadir ibn Kinana ibn Khuzayma ibn Mudrika ibn Ilyas ibn Nazar ibn Ma'adi ibn Adnan. All the way back. Right? We can name all the names. You want to know to Adam alayhi salam? You'll find narrations by Ibn Kafir rahmatullahi alayhi that tell you the narration of the, the Prophet peace be upon him's lineage which links him back right to the Prophet, Prophet Adam alayhi salam, the first, the first human being on the face of this earth. Right? Everything has been preserved. As far as the message goes of the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him, you want to learn the Quran, you want to know about the Quran, let's learn the Quran, let's understand the Quran. The Quran is something that, just, that, that, that not just someone just, it's not something that someone just wrote it down and said, oh, this is the book of God. The Islamic text, the Quran was preserved with complete authenticity to the highest standard for 1400 years. And how so? Not only did the Muslims write down copies of the Quran and have it present with them for 1400 years, but yet Muslims memorized it. We always made a point to memorize the text, right? And we memorized the text from a very young age. I still recall I completed my memorization of the entire Quran, page by page, verse by verse, word by word, vowel by vowel, dot by dot, and the very same way the Prophet Muhammad, peace be, peace be upon him, recited it when I was only 10 years old. And we would come to the mosque and we would listen to the, the, the leader of the prayer reciting. And if he ever made a mistake, for those Muslims that have been there, right? If the, prayer, if the leader in the, the mosque is, is praying and he makes a little mistake, what happens? The Muslims, they sit there and they, they, do they tolerate the mistake? They jump on it. Brother, you just made a mistake there. You better not say, Ahdina Salat al Mustaqim, otherwise I'm going to pound you. It's Ihdina Salat al Mustaqim. Read it, read it right. right? You don't say Sirat al Mustaqim. Pronunciation to the deep. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Welcome back from the beautiful reminder about knowledge. What we want to do today, inshallah ta'ala, towards this end of uh, the episode today, we want to talk a little more about seeking knowledge, but then we want to give some practical advice to people of all walks of life. So we want to give advice to mm -hmm. people maybe who are young, people who are old, people who um, don't have any knowledge but they want to start, people maybe who are new Muslims. A uh, sister was messaging us a few days ago that she had just become Muslim uh, right before Ramadan. Um, so there's all kinds of people that want to learn. And they don't know where to start. They don't know how much to take in. You don't want people to burn out, mm -hmm. right? We don't want people to kind of go to extremes or burn out or anything like this. We want to give advice to the busy people, the fathers, the busy mothers, uh, the mothers who are raising children. We want to give advice to students in colleges around the world while they're balancing their worldly knowledge, how to also seek Islamic knowledge. So we want to do this, inshallah ta'ala, by giving some action items. Before we get to that, I want to mention two quotes of Imam al-Ghazali, rahimahullah. So these are things that are very important to keep in mind. So he said there are three types of students of knowledge. All right? Three types of people who seek knowledge. The first are those who seek knowledge with evil intentions from the beginnings. And these people have a sin. Why? Because we know that the one who seeks knowledge for a worldly reason, as the Prophet told us, for a worldly reason, 
This person will not smell the fragrance of paradise on the day of judgment, although it can be smelled or discerned from 40 years distance of walking. Meaning they, they are going to go through punishment like this man that we mentioned in the hadith. You have to be seeking knowledge for the right reasons. The second thing um, is the type of student of knowledge that he mentioned who loves the praise that they get as a result of the knowledge, but their intention is for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So they are pleased with Allah and doing it for the sake of Allah, but when people praise them, they're, they're kind of happy, like they like it. And this, is, this happens a lot. But these people are still, at the very least, alhamdulillah, they're seeking knowledge for the sake of Allah. The third is the one who is truly successful, completely successful. These are the ones who purely dedicate themselves to the pleasure of Allah while they're teaching and learning. And the praise of people actually makes them more upset. They don't like it. It humbles them more. It doesn't give them arrogance. The second thing that he said is that there are three difficulties of knowledge. Three obstacles or difficulties or challenges. Number one is keeping yourself consistently in the pursuit of knowledge. This is a difficult thing to do. Because we all go through phases in life in which we have to you know, work on something else or we have a family or we have kids. So we get busy. So he said one of the difficulties of knowledge is to stay consistent. The second is that a person has to act upon the knowledge. Right? يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا لِمَا تَقُولُونَ مَا لَا تَفْعَلُونَ O you who have believed, Allah is saying, why do you say that or preach that which you do not practice? And Allah hates this. This is something Allah dis despises. So don't preach to the people something you're not acting upon unless you are trying your best to act upon it. The third challenge is that he said that you are saved and protected from your knowledge. Meaning that the knowledge will basically testify for you on the Day of Judgment. It will come on the Day of Judgment and say, Oh Allah, this person sought you for the <coughs> right reason. Now, let's ask this question so that people can benefit. What are some benefits we can say are from seeking knowledge? What are some virtues and benefits of seeking knowledge? So people can set their intentions right now. People who are listening and saying, I want to seek knowledge. I want to start with a book. I want to start with an online university or institute. I want to start by listening to a series of videos on YouTube or Huda TV or somewhere else. Mm -hmm. So they want to start. Let's give them the right intention. What's the first intention we can say the most important? Pleasure of Allah. To please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because He loves it. Right? So this is sincerity, pleasing Allah. What's another benefit, a good intention that we can add to it? Mm -hmm. To uh, spread Islam. To spread Islam to the people, to spread the message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Again, everything will fall under pleasing Allah, mm. but we want to have these intentions clear so people know where they're headed. What's another good intention for seeking knowledge? And we can worship Allah properly. We can worship Allah properly. Mm -hmm. So we learn how to worship Allah in the, in the best way possible. What's another good intention? Mm. Another good intention could be to benefit ourselves, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. To become enlightened. So some people, they have a hard time praying, they have a hard time fasting, they have a hard time reading the Qur'an. They don't feel connected <coughs> as much. Knowledge connects you to Allah. Yeah. Knowledge brings you closer to Allah without doubt. These are the most people that fear Allah, as we said in the beginning. So knowledge will bring you closer to Allah. Are there any other good intentions for knowledge we can add to this? Um, it kind of, it takes away ignorance. It takes away ignorance, dispels ignorance, which causes many problems around the world. Yeah. Many problems for us as individuals, for our family members, for our communities, and for the entire ummah. And even for non-Muslims. Yeah. Because we see in our times, wallahi, ignorance is what leads to all of these innovations, meaning these other deviant yeah. sects, these deviant fringe groups, these deviant extremists, all of these things, even the people who are trying to reform the religion, change the religion, make, it, uh, make something acceptable that's not acceptable. So all of these things fall under ignorance because the people who have real knowledge don't say these things. No. They don't fall into this trap of shaitan. So it dispels ignorance. It gives us enlightenment. It brings us closer to Allah. It makes us happier. Knowledge will make you more content. Mm. Because now you have more knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you're closer to Him, you're always thinking about Jannah, you're thinking about Qadr, you're thinking about Tawakkul, you're closer to Allah. Knowledge allows you to worship Allah in the best way possible. Mm. So when you say, Allahumma a'inna ala dhikrika wa shukrika wa husni ibadatik, in the best way to worship you, one of, this, one of these uh, solutions is through knowledge. Knowledge helps you spread da'wah to other people, to Muslims and non-Muslims. Mm. And that both are vital and crucial to our times. So knowledge does all of these things and more and ultimately it brings uh, the path uh, of Jannah. It makes it easier for us. Yes. And when a person starts seeking knowledge, um, even if he seeks like, a small amount of knowledge, that small amount will, would make him want more yes. of that knowledge. Um, this happens to me a lot. I mean, if, for instance, I ask a question because I'm very curious to know, um, SubhanAllah, how did, why did God do this uh, for us? Or why did the Rasulullah do this for us? Uh, this the answer brings up another question, which and it keeps going, keeps yeah. going, never ends. So like subhanallah, yeah. So it's the curiosity, the qu the thirst that's not quenched. Actually, like you know, increase your beliefs. 
also like yes. kind of like so it brings you closer to Allah exactly like so you know this is a really important point because a lot of people in our times especially in our times as we get closer to the the day of judgment a lot of people are falling to the traps of you know the rise of atheism even though it's irrational a lot of people are falling to the silly traps of you know corrupt philosophies that all contradict each other people are falling to the traps of shubuhat mm -hmm. uh, doubts in religion knowledge dispels all of this wallahi knowledge gets rid of all of this mm -hmm. And subhanAllah, the problem is these people, some of them who go astray, it's because they didn't find the knowledge, the correct knowledge, the or place. they didn't find the knowledge that they needed at that moment to remove the doubt. So knowledge protects your faith. It's mm -hmm. a shield for you. Yeah. Actually, like, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala orders us, like, you know, asks us, like, to seek knowledge, like, in the Quran, like, you know, فَسِيحُ فِي الْأَرْضِ فَانْظُرُوا 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 Like, go and, like, go and check, like, the earth and the skies and all these things. And the first, like, word was revealed with the Prophet be on him, like, اقرأ, like, read or recite. So like kind of we, oh, we as Muslims like kind of it's it's something is not optional to to be an ignorant Muslim or something mm -hmm. like this. I mean I, I will never blame you if you if you die like as as like kind of a poor guy, but if you die like as an ignorant, I will blame you for this, especially yeah. for your religion. Where some people like you know, unfortunately these days that like, they don't know anything about their the religion, like you know how they practice this or do this or do that. This is something like uh, sad in me. Subhanallah, yeah. that's very true. And knowledge doesn't yeah. really have. And even more so in our times. Mm -hmm. Even more so in our times because we have so much access to knowledge. Now we want to now get to the action items because we're in the last few minutes of our episode. What are some things uh, people can start doing inshallah ta'ala to be consistent with knowledge? Uh, some things people can <coughs> use in order to start their journey of knowledge or mm -hmm. to continue? To give them this motivation or something to take right now from today's episode inshallah ta'ala. Yes. See how I would say like uh, I find no excuse these days like you know to learn and get get knowledge. You don't have to travel as we mentioned before. You don't have to uh, pay money or like exert effort stuff like this. You can use like your current methods or like means as like a social media or like kind of uh, friends or people like PC, laptop, like uh, iPad, I iPhone, all these like kind of really nice like uh, wasting of time. Apple like products. yeah, I have products, things <laughs> I love. <them>. <laughs> 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 you can use them like kind of to get knowledge. These is, mashallah, like brothers and sisters, like you know, made like kind of great efforts, like you know, to bring all of those like kind of uh, uh, lessons and like lectures and like knowledge, like uh, for us, like online. You can yes. access them online, offline, even. Now, so here's one thing, uh, two things I want to say about this because now we have to end the show, inshallah. Mm -hmm. One point you brought up that's very important for people to know is one sign of sincerity is that you're willing to even not just travel but pay for it. Mm -hmm. Sadly in our times, especially you know in the West, a lot of people are not willing to pay for Islamic knowledge, but they will dish out so much money for other things, for worldly things, for food, for traveling, for vacations, for uh, halal parties, for whatever it may be, and even for secular knowledge and institutions and tuition. But when it comes to Islamic knowledge, they become cheap. You know, so, oh, I, I can't pay for this, this has to be free. Not everything is free, especially mm -hmm. if it's in a professional environment or if it's uh, done in a very professional kind of way or a self, you know, uh, mm -hmm. you know, a degree or whatever it may be. So all of these things require uh, some effort and some tuition and some, uh, you know, juhd, some, uh, you know, seeking and striving for yeah. it. Now we have to close off, but we want to say this: mm -hmm. one of the action items is start uh, by finding resources around you in your location, in your locality. Find maybe a local scholar that's trustworthy. Make sure this person is trustworthy. Find an institute that teaches online videos. And there's many free videos. You don't have to be rich. Mm -hmm. You can find series online. Somebody wants to study tafsir, they can go online and find much tafsir, mashallah. And find it in your language. Find it in a way you can understand it. You can study. Tafsir is very important. Studying the Quran. Study basics of, uh, of fiqh, basics of aqidah. You can find all of these online. Alhamdulillah. And if you can find a scholar or an institute to go to, that's even better. Mm -hmm. You can find many Islamic universities online and offline. Yes, you can find uh, people who are willing to give you some time to teach you. People who are willing to answer your questions. We even here on Huda TV, we have Ask Huda, Alhamdulillah. Yes, we have uh, this series that, that we went through. People can go search through it and other series as well. So there's so many resources. If someone is busy, at the very least, they can set a small amount of time every week or every few days to study, if not every day. Even the busy mother or the busy father, they can find time, wallahi, to study. And even if it's as simple, as simple as reading a book, as reading a book of seerah or hadith or something, wallahi, you look back at it after a year or two years, you said, I've learned so much. Five years later, you've changed completely. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us beneficial knowledge Amen. and to allow us to be sincere in our seeking of knowledge. Amen. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive us for our shortcomings. Jazakumullah khairah. Thank you to our guest. Make dua for the brothers here and the ones that you don't see behind the scenes. We will see you inshallah ta'ala tomorrow is our second last uh, live episode. Jazakumullah khairah. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.